Hey guys, welcome back to Pop'em Up Chem and today we're going to be looking at the last lesson of acids and bases and that is titration curves and indicators. Please comment down below to let me know how you feel, like, subscribe, hit the bell icon and of course share the channel, share the videos and check out our other videos too. Links and timestamps as always will be in the description. Okay then, so we are going to be first looking at how to sketch titration curves, then how indicators work using the PK IND or PK indicator, and then we're going to evaluate indicator suitability based on that value. First of all, as usual, there's a refresh question, so go ahead and pause the video to give yourself a moment for that. Okay, great. So if we have a look at this question, first of all, a good idea if you don't know where to start is to just write out all of the ions. So I'm going to write out all the ions. So we've got sodium sulfate as our first one. Then we've got ammonium nitrate. So that's NH4 and NO3 minus and sodium ethanoate. So that's CH3COO minus and aluminium nitrate. That's Al3 plus and nitrate. So then I'm just going to cross out all of the conjugates of strong acids or bases. And that's going to allow me to work out what's going to happen to the pH. So here I have the ethanoate ion will react with H plus to form ethanoic acid. That will mean it will remove H plus from the solution and make the pH larger than seven. And with the ammonium, ion it's going to react with OH minus to make the pH less than 7 so the answer is indeed C. Okay on with titration curves then. So a titration curve is basically a graph of volume added versus the pH change while you're adding this and this can be done with adding an acid to a base or a base to an acid doesn't matter. So let's have a little closer look at the kind of anatomy of what a titration curve might look like. So there's going to be an axis and on your X axis, you're going to have the volume added in centimeters cubed. And then on the Y axis, you're going to have pH. And because we're going to do this example with a weak acid strong base, we're going to start from a pH maybe of about two. And you'll see the curve then goes straight up all the way up to the 13, 14 kind of level. Down the middle, we have this vertical component and we call that vertical component the equivalence point. So this is the point at which the color change, if you like, on a titration would happen. And there's a couple of other things that you need to be able to pick out in these as well. So here, because we have a weak acid, you can see this region um, where we have kind of the pH staying static, that is the buffer region, okay? As we're adding it, again, remember the half neutralization point, remember looking at buffers, we're gonna get a buffer as we add more base. Right in the middle of that, and so this is exactly half of the volume of the equivalence point is we call the half equivalence point. And the half equivalence point is very important because at the half equivalence point, the pH is equal to the pKa and we'll come back to that and we'll evidence that uh, later on but that's an important point as well and then obviously at our y-intercept we have the pH of the acid or base as the case may be so so we can look at these for example graphs so here we're using adding an acid to a base and you can see how the structure of them changes slightly when we use strong or weak acids or bases in both of the cases when we have a strong base we see that it start at a very high ph and then gradually decline until we get to that vertical component until it drops down now when we're titrating it with a strong acid you see that go all the way down right to the bottom very low ph and when we've got a weak acid you see we drop down to a ph that's you know three four five range it would obviously depend on the weak acid and of course when we see using a weak base then we see the kind of gradual decline, although we see it slightly differently because of the buffer region, and then it drops off if we're using a strong acid. You'll see when we use weak acid, weak base, 
there's actually very little vertical component. And that vertical component, remember, that's our endpoint. That's the key to understanding these graphs. And that's why usually we don't use a titration of a weak acid and weak base because it's very difficult for us to guarantee where the endpoint will be. Okay, so hopefully you can see how the graph shape relates to whether you're using a strong or a weak base. Let's get you doing a question or two on that. First question, sketch the graph you would expect to see for the addition of ethanoic acid to potassium hydroxide. Pause the video to give yourself a moment for that. Pop them up. And hopefully we can see that ethanoic acid is a weak acid and potassium hydroxide is a strong base. So we're going to be starting up at the top where the strong base would be come down and our curve will not reach the bottom because we don't have a strong acid fantastic next question sketch the graph you would expect to see for the addition of one molar ammonium solution to 25 centimeters cubed of one molar hcl solution so the concentrations do matter here so have a little think about this one pause the video here to give yourself a little time for that pop them up so hopefully you can see that one molar hcl solution is obviously going to give us a ph of zero so we're going to have that curve going up and then importantly we're going to have that vertical component go through 25 centimeters cubed and then the solution will not reach a high ph because we're just using ammonia so we'll have that vertical component at 25 then we can mark that next question why would carrying out a titration of ammonia and ethanoic acid likely give inconsistent results pause the video here to give yourself some time for that pop them up okay hopefully you realize here these are both weak acids and bases so if you have weak acid and bases we can have no guarantee of where that vertical component is going to be and therefore no meaningful endpoint because we can't know that we will consistently produce that vertical component of the endpoint with a weak acid and base okay now that we've had a look at those graphs let's have a look at how indicators fit in to our pitch here so we've come across indicators before and we know that they're things that color depends on the ph so above or below certain areas they will have different colors so these usually change once sometimes twice um universal indicator is actually an exception but it's because it's a combination of multiple different indicators but that's not too important the important thing here is that even though the ph changes over a small range because of the logarithmic nature of ph i.e ph1 being 10 times stronger than uh, ph2 and so on and so forth it means that one drop usually equates to a large enough change to make the indicator go from one color to another color which makes them a very useful tool to help us with titrations so let's have a look at how these actually work so indicators are acids and bases in their own right and in solution they kind of form an equilibrium just like we had ha goes to a minus and h plus we have in h goes to in minus and h plus so we already see we're going to be able to form an equilibrium expression for this so the indicator with a proton attached is going to be one color and an indicator without the proton attached is going to be another color and so the indicators change depending on the ph because of changes in their structure um, now it's not important that you know in detail how these changes in structure affect the changes in color however it is quite interesting and when we look at organic and biochem they'll be quite useful as well you can see in this diagram here that we have an example of phenolphthalein you can see the colorless solution and the pink solution 
So what happens between the transition of these two molecules and the losing of the protons is you can see that we have alternate single and double bonds going around the entire molecule of the pink phenolphthalein. And that color derives from that conjugation, which is the alternate single and double bond. That alternate single and double bond allows the pi bonds throughout the molecule to interact and this allows them to absorb and emit different photons therefore causing our color so all throughout this unit we've used expressions for equilibrium constants as the grounding of what we're doing and indicators is no different we can still write an expression for k eind and it will be exactly the same as the expressions we've been looking at before we're going to have products over reactants so we're going to have h plus and i n minus and i n h on the bottom so this is the same kind of equilibrium expre expression that we've already been used to drawing earlier in the unit and in the previous unit so we're going to do something that we haven't done with this expression before is consider what's actually happening at the point at which color changes in these. Well, remember we said that if we have I N H goes to I N minus and H plus with one side representing one color and one, one side representing the other at the exact point of the color change, we must be switching from a higher concentration of the reactant to a higher concentration of the product or vice versa. So as you can see from the equation, let's say if I get to the point where all of a sudden I N minus is of higher concentration, then it's going to become the color of I N minus and the reverse is true for the reactants as well. So the point at the exact point of the color change, we could say that I N minus and I N H are exactly equal even though that's theoretical there is a point at which they are equal which is very helpful for us if we think about the calculations because that's going to make them the same on the top and bottom of the fraction we just cancel them out this leaves us with the very simple expression of k eind is equal to h plus at the point at which the color change is occurring of course that means we can get our familiar friend the negative log out and if we have the pKa is equal to the pH or the pK eind as the case may be here is equal to the pH at the point of the color change which is the same as the point of half neutralization if you like which is where we said on the graph at the beginning of the lesson you'll remember I said that the point of half neutralization pH is equal to pKa this extends on that. This means that the pKa can be used to determine the range over which an indicator is used or the pKa end as we're describing it here and that range is usually plus or minus one pH around that pKa or that pKa end. You're given a lot of these values in your data booklet so don't worry about remembering any of these. Here's an example of a few of your data booklet. So just to make clear on that then just clearing up one misconception about indicators is they are not used to measure pH. P color change is not an accurate measurement. The range of the color limits the measurements that can be taken. So they are only used to determine the end point of reactions in titrations. We can combine the two ideas that we've looked at this lesson of indicators and pH curves and have a look at how we might use pH curves to determine a suitable indicator. So here's a graph showing the pH curve for adding an alkali to a base. This is a strong alkali, strong base, and they're both at 0.1 molar concentrations. So, and let's just say they're monoprotic as well. So we can see that the pH starts at one and the pH ends at 13 and if we use 25 centimeters cubed, then we're going to have the end point at 25 centimeters cubed as well. There's very little change along the bottom. That means there's very little buffer region. And we have a very sharp increase in pH as we go up. This long linear portion of the graph is going to be where we determine our indicator. 
So I'm going to take the ranges of the pH that the indicators work on from your data book booklet and kind of represent them graphically here. Now you can see the overlay of the different three that I've picked and how they overlap with this vertical portion. Any indicator that's whole range is contained within that vertical portion could be used as a suitable indicator for this reaction. So in this reaction, phenolphthalein, litmus and methyl orange could be used as indicators because their range lies within the vertical component of that graph. So they are going to change color within one drop. Let's have a little look if we use a weak acid and a strong base to see how this changes. So already we can see the difference with starting at a higher pH because we have a weak acid in this case, um, pH of four to begin with. And then we can see that slow increase as we go through the buffer region of the acid. And then a kind of smaller sharp increase, a smaller vertical component of the graph at our end point going all the way up to again the same uh, final pH because we're still using the same concentration of strong base so pH 13 to finish. Now if we overlay the same indicators and the same indicators ranges let's just see how we differ from before. Now we can see that through that vertical component Methyl orange is nowhere near it. In fact, its entire range lies outside of that. Litmus is, does have some part of its range inside that vertical component, but it tends to drift off. And what this means is that we can't guarantee between, for example, litmus looks about 22 or 23 centimeters cubed. The color may change within a larger range of volume. Indeed, in methyl orange, that could be anywhere from zero to about 18 centimeters cubed. So both of those are unsuitable for this reaction and only phenolphthalein has its whole range over that very small change in volume, allowing one drop to change that final color. So to quickly give another example of the third potential, which is strong acid and weak base, we can see now that the vertical component has moved down, so methyl orange becomes appropriate. Litmus is probably not quite appropriate as well because of the change in range towards the end of that vertical component. And phenolphthalein is again out of our range, so it's important that we know this about our reaction when we're choosing an appropriate indicator, as we can see. So lastly, we can turn our attention to the carnal sin of titrations, which is titrating a weak acid and a weak base. Now, the astute among you may already see the problem we have here, and that is that there is very little or zero vertical component that we can speak of in this graph. And that means it's gonna be very hard to have a indicator that has a range fit over this vertical component. Let's just quickly overlay the exact same indicators we've already been using. You can see here that although litmus may be close, it still will use a larger volume, still potentially two or three mil. So at no point in any of these can we guarantee it. We've got a huge range in which methyl orange could change color, a, a smaller range for litmus um, and still quite a large range for phenolphthalein so we couldn't guarantee that the titration would be repeatable and, and get concordant results at all no matter how perfect our titration skills were so some of the main takeaways from this lesson are the acid-base titration curves have a characteristic shape and that shape is dependent on the strength or weakness of the acids and bases that are used and the flatter vertical points of the graph are used to determine the end point. And we can line up these vertical components with the ranges of indicators to find a suitable indicator for our reaction. Of course, you're gonna to wanna to make sure you do some questions, making sure you understand how to apply these ideas. Thanks for watching guys. As always, you can comment below, let me know what you think about the content, like, subscribe, hit the bell icon, share this video, share the channel, and check out our other videos on our other channels.
as always, practice